Amen? Yes. Now there's a scripture and uh, it's found in Esther 4.14 and it, in the King James it goes like this. For don't you know that you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Now very interesting, it's really saying is obviously you don't know. And obviously I do. So Mordecai knew, Esther didn't. Here's the problem. Mordecai wasn't the one it was about. Esther was the one it was about. And she didn't know. She had completely missed what was going on. She was not aware of what God was wanting to do in her life or what time it was in the kingdom. Now in this particular verse that I'm reading to you here, it says you've got to understand what the will of the Lord is and you've got to redeem the time. That actually means to catch back that which is lost. The word time actually is the word kairos, which means a specific moment in time. In other words, you need to see what moment in time it is and catch it back, ransom it back. Don't miss out. Now, if I didn't do, go anywhere else, I would ask you the question, do you think in your life there were times you missed it? Yes, absolutely. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And do you think that there are times that could have changed your life or many other people's lives if you were aware of what was going on? See, for instance, how many of you know that Jesus was used to heal? Three people. Let's try that one again. I just need to know if you actually know anything from the Bible. How many of you know that Jesus was used to heal? Yeah. Yet there's a scripture in Luke 5 and verse 17 in the King James, in the original uh, authorized version, you know, authorized by a king. And it says this that the power of the Lord was present to heal, and it was Jesus who was using it. Now, you would have said, well, Jesus can always do it, but Jesus noticed the moment when the Holy Spirit came on him in such power that there were more healings than normal. You're catching that? So Jesus, a man, the Son of God, responds to the Holy Spirit when he moves. This is the same Jesus that knew what people were thinking when he was told. He didn't know everything everybody was thinking. He knew it when he was told it. He knew how to respond to the moment. Now, I actually believe that God has moments. I actually believe that that conference had a moment. It was literally called a mantle conference because of a prophetic dream and some of us having prophetic visions that God was wanting to drop something back on the church. But sometimes we're so busy with our lifestyle that we are not there for what God wants to do. Sometimes, I'm just going to get honest before I get the context, sometimes we can't be bothered to put ourselves out for anything. And I'll catch it online. You can't catch hands being laid on you online. I'm not against being online. I, I believe in it all. But sometimes you have to do something. Sometimes, I'm sorry for just getting out there before we start. Sometimes we're so narcissistic. It's all about me that we miss what's all about God. So God's up to something, but I'm so busy with me and, and my job and what I'm up to. I, I'm just so busy that I miss the time that God might do something for me or even through me because I'm not available. So you have Jesus teaching in Luke 5. He's teaching the crowds. The crowds crush him. He looks for an available boat. He happens to choose the most available boat, which happens to belong to Simon Peter just happens to be there and it just happens to be clean and so he just happens to get in it and he just happens to say to Simon Peter push out a little bit from shore and Simon Peter is available because the king just got in his boat and he doesn't really know who he is yet but he feels something so he says I'm available I don't think I want to miss this time he could have said master I told you all night I want to go home to bed but the master just got in the boat and so the master says, push out a little bit from shore. So he pushes out a little bit from shore and then sits there when the most anointed man that ever lived speaks from his boat. Now think that one through. 
right time, right place, redeemed. So then Jesus thinks, I think I'll go further with this. Because I know who's sitting in the boat. So he says, I want you to go out into the deep. Now, how many of you know the deep you can't control? Which means if you're going to see God do anything in your life, you've got to get out of control. You see, in the shallow, if that's the shallow, I can still put my feet down and control where I go. But the moment I go out into the deep, now someone else is in control of where I am. Are you catching this? So he pushes it out into the deep and then says to Simon Peter, let your nets down. And Simon Peter went, hey, 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 I've gone this far with you. But I'm the fisherman, you're just God. (laughs) You just entered into most of our lives. You might be God, but you have no understanding what I'm going through. He not only has understanding, he understands what you're thinking while you're going through it. So he he says, but because you said so, I'll redeem the time. (laughs) Because you said so, I'll snap up the moment and I'll let my nets down. I'm not expecting anything because I'm the fisherman. You don't really know what you're talking about, but I'll do it. So he lets his nets down and king of kings calls the fish to the net. The fish turned up in the net, and Jesus said, pull it in if you can. So Peter, Simon Peter, tries to pull it in, and the net is full of fish, and I'm just going short circuit here, and he falls down. He says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. How on earth did you put that with catching fish? Because the moment was where the king of kings revealed who he was and the fear of the Lord fell in the boat all because a man was available at a certain time. He could have said, I'm sorry. I'm too busy. Hold on, one needs a drink of water. I'm always amused when a Texan tells me how to speak English. It's the strangest thing. She's kissing him and saying, learn, be quiet. If you don't stop, you'll get a word of knowledge. You know he will. (laughs) We've got to understand that most of the time we are just not available. And I don't want to end up in heaven and find out I missed the thing that would have changed my life and everybody else's life because I was tired. Or I, I'm not being funny, or I was too sickly, or I was too busy. Keep going. The prophecies are coming everywhere. <laughs> Any more prophecies flowing? And, and we can laugh, but we need to let the Holy Spirit settle on us. Because in the context, he says, you've got to understand the will of the Lord. You've got to be wise, not unwise. You've got to stop acting contextually like the world. You're supposed to be walking in the light, not in the dark, but most of the church walked in the dark and not the light because most of the church is more caring about what goes on in the culture than what goes on in the kingdom. So he says you've got to create a lifestyle. And in this lifestyle, when the moment comes, you will be aware of it. So I'm going to pick on the lifestyle just for a minute. Uh, The lifestyle is this, okay? An attitude. Well, most of you are good for that. An attitude that says, I can't miss it. If you don't have an attitude that that I can't miss it, you'll have an attitude that you will miss it. And an attitude that stops saying to yourself, self, I'm not that valuable. If Jesus can pick on a fisherman who smelt of fish and has just been cleaning his net, so he's not got the cleanest of hands. If he can pick on a, quote, nobody, he can pick on an anybody, which means anybody that's a nobody could be somebody if somebody gets in their boat. Stop saying, I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too this, I'm too that. Just start saying, yes, I want an attitude. Lord, give me an attitude that I don't want to miss anything. I'm just warming up, you know that. Secondly, 
we need to understand that wisdom says, not only do I live that way, but wisdom says I live in a certain manner. And it's my choice. We're told to do it. And here is the manner. I'm supposed to, number one, walk in the will of God as I know it to be. Whatever you know that God has recorded in His Word concerning His will is yours to walk. I've noticed, and I'm not being rude, I've noticed how people love the Scriptures that pertain to what they want to do. But they don't love the Scriptures that don't go with their particular thing. But how many of you know the Scriptures are all Scriptures and they're all there for you? And the will of the Lord is already written, but there is a specific will of the Lord. And I'm going to use Romans 8, 14, so that the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God, which means He wants to lead you into what it is the will of God for you is. If it's right with God, which is a start, stay right with men. If any of you don't forgive people, you will never, ever, ever see what God has for you. Because it's the will of God. But I need to walk in, you know, I might say to, to, to God, and I, I have said it to God, look, if, if I had my way, I don't like this heat. All right? Some of you are used to it. I don't know how you ever get used to it. But I, I w- this is, if I had my way. The one thing I'm happy for Robert, he, he got so blessed, that he's so blessed, that one of his books sold you a million copies and it looks like the next one is going to do. How many of you know if you sell a million copies, you might have some finance coming in? And he put it in his ministry and, and the Lord gave him two commands. He gave him a command to move back to Waco and so because of the blessing, he was able to just buy a house out of the ministry. Anybody complaining right now? No, no, no. Uh, except for the fact it's Waco. Because Waco was not where he wanted to be. And then the Lord gave him a dream and told him, I want you to also put your foot on the land in Colorado. So, so the blessing of the Lord enabled him to have a house in Waco and a house in Colorado. And this is very good. Yes, sir. I could get jealous, but you're not allowed to be because it opens the door to everything. And so instead of him saying, Lord, it's so stinking hot in Waco, he just moves to Colorado. And then when he feels like going, he just moves back. And this is my dream. I can see a place. No, it's not England, it's Ireland. I want to open the door in the morning. I want to hear the Irish birds singing. And I want to hear them say, Top of the morning! Particularly in the middle of summer. I want the Lord to send me somewhere else, and he hasn't agreed. I'm really trying to persuade him, Lord, do you understand? But it's not the will of the Lord. The will of the Lord is to fry with the rest of you. (laughs) But it's the will of the Lord. The will of the Lord is to minister to you. You catching it? It's the will of the Lord. But I've got to walk the will of the Lord. Not my will, but thy will be done. Whatever you specifically open for me to do, I must do, even if I don't prefer it. Secondly, it says this, that you need to create an atmosphere for which you can be filled by God. So it says you start to minister to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, the worship team clearly does that to us, but how many of you have created a worship lifestyle that you listen to worship? When we got our our dog that was once a puppy, and it's now a dog, acts like a puppy, one of the the guys that was good with dogs, I said, well, how did I calm it? Just come away and tell me the things. He said, play music. So I didn't play Led Zeppelin. Don't want to say, <laughs> no, no, I, I didn't do that. I played worship. And I have left that worship on every single night in our house. So when I come out in the night, I hear worship. When I come home after getting a coffee, I hear worship. I've created worship. And sometimes I'll just stand there and listen to it. But because of it, a worshipful spirit is in me. 
When you create a worshipful spirit, it says in Psalm 22 and verse 3 that the Lord sits on worship. It's not how much you can listen to how great someone else is at worship, that you are worshipful. And your worshipful spirit creates something that allows the Holy Spirit to be able to show you moments because you're open to the one who sits on your worship. It says, don't only do that, but do it to other people. Start sharing your worship, your songs with other people. Start ministering, because if God can find the person that ministers through the, these things, He can find a, a person that He can minister through. Then it says, live a thankful life, not a moaning, groaning. The gas is too high life. It is too high. But if you moan about it, it might go higher. You don't come from Europe. You need to spend some time there. It was $7 a gallon years ago. But the bottom line, I can moan all day or I can be thankful for what I have. You ought to put the gas in saying, Lord Jesus. And as you do that, say, thank God I can pay for it. Because if you don't lead a thankful life, you lead a moaning life and the Holy Spirit doesn't hang around moaners. When Jesus healed those ten lepers and only one came back, he said, whoa. If he'd been, if he'd been Spanish, he'd have said, ¿Qué? No entiendo. What's going on? What's going on is that you're not thankful. Have you ever lived around non-thankful people? Uh, you know those type of people that are takers, 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 takers? Some of you need to listen. The leech has two daughters. Give, give, they cry, but they never say thank you. I, I, I don't like taking people out for anything if they don't say thank you. And I'm just me. And in fact, this is me. I won't keep blessing you if you don't say thank you because I don't believe that you're good soil. Because God can't bless non-thankful people. And we've developed this moaning, groaning, whether, whether, whether you're, you're a Republican or a Democrat, and here all, all the opinions suddenly appear about things that you hardly know anything about. And run your mouth and complain and criticize. And we start there and we go with the president and we come down and we attack the governor. And we always oh, somebody we're having it because that's just how it is. And suddenly you create in your life something that God can't bless. And the Holy Spirit doesn't hang around that moaning spirit. So as a result, though He is in you because the Spirit of Christ is in you, he, the, the function of what He wants to do is not there. You, you can't know the moments because you're such a moaner, you wouldn't know. I'm going to tell you where I used to live. I used to live in a place called Ilkeston. It used to be called Elkstone. And it was in Sherwood Forest. I'm trying to get you to know anything. Robin Hood. All right, thank you. And it's pretty, isn't it? But Ilkston, Elkiston, it, it really isn't because it's an old place where all the coal mines were underneath. And uh, I remember one day I'd gone back to visit. I was ministering around the area, and it's raining. And as it's raining, there was a high street, and you walked all the way up the high street. And I watched the faces of the people. The rain is beating in their face, and I didn't see anybody smiling. They're just walking up like that. How many of you know that even though you're pretending you're smiling, your spirit is all over your face? And prophetic people see you even though you go, aren't I looking like a Christian today? But your spirit emanates an attitude. And I'm telling you, he's saying to you, look, you've got to redeem the time. You've got to know how to live. You've got to live like this. Next, he says, you've got to live in a submissive lifestyle. Now, that just hit America with a 10-pin bowling ball. Because a submissive lifestyle means you submit. If the speed limit says 25 means it. There is a reason it says 25, because if you go faster, a kid might walk out in front of you, and you might hit it. I came in here very early this morning, before some of you knew that the birds were even alive. And as I walked in, 
I was driving in and a person behind me came speeding down the road, just down here, at at least 55. At least 55. That person did not live a submissive lifestyle. You see, when I'm submissive, I submit to the things that I need to submit to. I don't submit to things against God, but I submit to things in life. And it says submit to one another. In other words, we've got a submissive lifestyle. So if you're serving and someone asks you to do something, you just don't say, no, that's against my American rights. Because you're submissive. You've got to understand what I'm taking you. If I live a submissive lifestyle, the Holy Spirit can say something to me knowing I will submit. You know, you heard that that, that, that old thing that went on between a husband and wife. And the wife said to the husband, you know the problem with you? What? You're too argumentative. No, I'm not. It'll sink in. What that was really saying was, I can pick an argument with you anytime because it's very easy to. And a non-submissive lifestyle, I'm going to get you because I want you to have the best in God, is a, is, as a lifestyle says, nobody can speak into my life at all. Nobody has a right to speak to me because it's me and Jesus. Well, then what Bible did you buy? Because you and Jesus happens to be the head and the body and interconnecting places. And you and Jesus happens to be the one that puts guardians and trustees over your life to help you go somewhere. You heard that brilliant. I love Jeremy Nelson. He's coming back. All right. But do you hear how God trained him? He trained him under some of the most severe prophetic people you could get under and taught him submission so that he could use him by the way of the Spirit. But if I've got a non-submissive lifestyle, if all my heckles come up, they're always telling me what to do. I'm telling you, you're going to miss these moments that are about to come to your life. Instead of being submissive, instead of living a joyful and thankful lifestyle, which creates the, the moments that I can perceive what God is up to. Then it tells us something else. Don't be drunk with wine where is an excess. Now, I, I know I could tickle a couple of toes here. I'm not over whether you drink wine or don't drink wine. I'm not over whatever you do. I'm over the excessive lifestyle. Excessive lifestyle. It says in Ephesians 4, when you lose sensitivity, you give yourself over to sensuality. And an excessive lifestyle, it's not just about whether you drink too much, it's whether you eat too much, it's whether you watch too many shows, it's whether you're caught up in, in that excessive... Some, some people love working hard to the excess that their families are neglected. It's an excessive lifestyle. Some of you can get, even get excessively religious. And you set yourself as the super standard of everything and look down on any lesser being that doesn't have the high quality of walk with God. And it's an excessive lifestyle. Actually warns you in Ecclesiastes not to do that. He says, don't be excessive. Rather be excessive. Don't be excessive. Rather be excessive. I don't want you to excess in carnality because you'll miss God, but excess should come in be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting that a dog at 5 a.m. knows it's thirsty? But a Christian doesn't even know it. So I come out this morning, the dog's next to the, the bowl. I'm saying, what are you doing there? My dog tries to talk. I mean, it really is trying. I'd love to lay hands. I'd love to lay in Jesus' name speak, but I'm scared of what it would say. But <laughs> it would probably say, you idiot, can't you say? But the dog knew it was thirsty, but most Christians don't even know they're thirsty. They walk around saying there's something wrong. There's something. I know there's something wrong. You need a touch of God. And he says, it's your job to create a lifestyle in you where you are be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I understand it's another teaching, but do you know how to live that lifestyle? If you worship, he sits on worship. If you pray, he sits in the middle of prayer. If you pray in tongues, it builds you up so it can become a habitation. If you hang around other people that are filled with God, it's easier to get filled with God. 
But it's your job. All of that to get you to the point. If your lifestyle is not correct, how on earth can you redeem the time because you wouldn't even know what time it is? So I need you to understand that if you create the right lifestyle, you don't need to come in here for a top-up, even though I love to give you top-ups. All right? You're already topped up. Now we're just going to get the excessive overflow. I'm telling you this before God. I live my life to get so filled with God so that when you're near me, I can give something that I have out. And I'm looking for more and more and more. So if I meet anybody, for instance, when Jeremy Nelson talked about uh, Oral Roberts praying for him, I, st I stopped and waited. You know, because everybody ran around and everybody runs around. And I think sometimes they forgot what they were asking for. And everybody ran around. And I waited and I said, Jeremy, I want to know how this went. How long was his hands on you? He said, really not very long because I didn't last very long. So the big hand came on me. The next minute, I'm rolling around the floor. And Jerry's the type that would roll around the floor. Yeah. Most people are so busy trying to be, no, no, that didn't touch me at all. I'd be touched, just be touched. And so I said, I want that. So when Robert started that incredible whatever, what that was on Friday night, it was a swimming pool glory moment, all right? When he started that, I said, Jeremy, I want that. So, so he laid hands on me. This is the truth before God. I saw a moment. I knew he had it. I've watched him. He put his hand right here. And this, is, this force field shot through my chest. I knew I had it. Something started. Now Robert's praying, have it! Because have it, you know, he's very accessible. And I sit over here watching this incredible thing going on. It was like watching people swim in backstrokes. And I waited and waited until he stopped for a second. I walked up to him. I said, I don't just want that. This is what I want. Because I've been prophesied that this is what I'm supposed to walk in. I want that mantle. I saw a moment because I knew a moment. Are you catching me? Well, I can always catch you online. You won't catch that one online. You must understand. So how does God create those moments? Because it literally means a divine moment. Divine moments for what? Divine moments for God to touch you. Divine, divine moments for God to use you. Divine moments for God to equip you. Divine moments for God to speak to you. There are moments. These moments can change the rest of your life. For instance, have you ever had a prophecy and you heard the prophecy, but you didn't hear it all? Yeah. Some of you have never had a prophecy. Would you, would you like one? All right. I heard this prophecy. It was an amazing prophecy. And it went like this. You know, I was praying, should I go to America? Should I go to America? And I had visitations from God. I had words from God. I had people having dreams. It just amazing moments. And suddenly I said, Lord, I want this confirming. And a group of prophets prayed in the south of England and called me and said, this is the word of the Lord. And they started quoting to me, he is my chosen vessel. And I knew as I was listening to them, that God was confirming, I didn't hear the second part of the prophecy. The second part of the prophecy, and he will suffer many things for my sake. In other words, I was so busy with the good bit <laughs> that I missed the bad bit. I missed the bad bit because I didn't want to listen to the bad bit because I only wanted to listen to the bit I wanted to listen to. If I'd listened to the whole of it, I would have got the whole of it and been ready for the whole of it. In other words, we must be a people that live in a place, whatever God wants to say, we're prepared because we're responding to that moment. It could be a moment where he sends you somewhere. It could be a moment that he wants to equip you. Can I just say this to you? Some people are silly. God's clearly moving at the front. And the Holy Spirit is clearly touching people, but you don't want to look like a fool. You look like a bigger fool sitting where you were who refused to move with God. Some of you have even made this statement, it's not my personality. Well, wow. God, you can't touch me in this divine moment because it's not my personality. 
You don't know what he's going to do to you. It doesn't matter. Whatever he's doing, you should know. So he, he sometimes speaks. He sometimes, sometimes he gives you a word. Sometimes he gives you a dream. Sometimes a prophet comes up to you. You should be as alert as the day because you don't know the moment. But if you're prepared, your spirit is ready for divine moments. It could be a moment of a new job. It could be a moment of anything. But you're prepared for the moment. Dreams, visions, words of the Lord or atmospheres. Suddenly God, like he did with Jesus, invades the atmosphere. As he invades the atmosphere, it's a moment somebody might have brought that in for your benefit. But it's a moment. I've heard these people. I've, I've heard them. I'm not much into prophecy. Just going to give you scriptures for, for your benefit. You just quenched the Holy Spirit. Just to help you. I'm not much into prophecy. I don't think it's real for today. So what part of the Holy Spirit's word should we whip out? Hold on. Shh, that's not God. Shh, that's not God. Shh, that's not God. And shh, that's not God. Well, that's Old Testament. Well, that's not God. So we're left with Jesus who talks about prophecy. So you're a liar. Yeah, but I've met false prophets. I've met silly people. I've met people so dumb I don't know why they're, why they're walking. But they are. Good. You're good, good. But of course, there's always excess. But am I going to deny a moment? I'm going to get on top of myself any second now. I think because of my personality, I shut down moments. I get embarrassed when, you, you don't know this, I get embarrassed when people are watching me. And you're watching me. What are you watching me for? Why are you looking at me? Will you stop? It's, <laughs> it's, it's okay when I'm under the anointing, but when I start ministering to people, I, I become self-conscious. And my, my personality shuts me down, sometimes from something. You need to walk up. At the end of the conference, I, I wrote to Robert and G uh, Jeremy. I said, thank you. Yeah. See the attitude? Yeah. <laughs> thank you for walking out and leaving everybody with me. Thank you. <laughs> they did. And here I was. Can you believe? Can you believe? Can you believe? Can I? I thought, I'll get you to. But my natural personality would walk away from it. And I think sometimes I shut down what God is doing through a vessel. But some of you need to get an attitude so you're not walking anywhere. And if you do, I'll walk right after you because if that's going on, I want what's going on. Am I, am I going too far? I haven't started. So he does it through dreams, he does it through prophets, he does it through prophecies, he does it through moments, he does it through visitations. But because we're living wisely, we are aware of that moment. We sense it on a person, we sense what's going on, we sense that person's carrying that, we sense that person has healing. Uh, we, needed, we had a, a, a need the other day, I knew Jeremy was used in healing, so I brought him over and said, would you pray the healing? I'm not missing my moments. And even if my moments make me move from a country to another country, I cannot miss my moments. You see, because I'm living so that I can have my moments. I believe there's going to be some moments hit this church that are going to shock you. God told me many years ago that because he could trust me with the anointing, he would bring me before many anointed men, which means I'm going to have people turn up among you that will shock you that they turned up because God created a moment. So that my quick finish is, how do I respond? Pretending that I'm living right where I should be. Like, watch this. This is right where I should be. I'm going to give you three illustrations. People that you know. Here is the moment that we've been talking about where Elijah in 1 Kings 19, 16 is told to go and anoint Elisha as a prophet in his stead. 
1 Kings 19, 19, Elisha is plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. It's kind of interesting that he's not sleeping. It's kind of interesting that he's on the move. It's kind of interesting that he's serving his father. He's plowing with his father's oxen. And as he's there, it says Elijah walks up be behind him and takes his mantle and touches him. And as he's touched, he has a moment. And the moment is, do I go, whoa. I think that's the, that's the best one I've had. You're laughing because you've seen it. I've said to people, I'm not into that pick them up, pick them up again. I, I, that's not my style. If someone goes down under the glory of God, I'd rather leave you down to figure out why you are down. Because it was a moment. And suddenly Elisha says to himself, Moment! Yes, yes, yes. Now what am I going to do? Moment! Chase that! Question mark, who is he? Answer, haven't the foggiest. Question mark, have you seen his clothes? Don't look too good. Who's his friends? Don't know. What's his reputation? Haven't the foggiest. But all I know is I got a moment. I either go after him or I miss my moment. I must redeem it. It says he chases after him. As he chases after him, Elijah is a real good spiritual father. Turns around and said, what have I got to do with you? Buzz off. I did my job. Splat. I wasn't supposed to do any more. God never mentioned any more. And Elisha said, I don't care what God mentioned. I'm having what you've got. I'm not going to leave you alone until I have what you've got. Because I felt the moment. I responded to the moment. I've always wished this was balsa when I'd throw it. Do you ever feel like the Holy Spirit so touches you? You just... And don't do that to me. I can hear something. No, no, no. No, it never happens to me because it was gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Then what did he do in the temple with the whip? It was a moment. Give you another one. You want another one? Thank you. I'm going to give you three of these big illustrations from three men's life to show you what they did at what moment. It literally says he follows and he serves. Some say six years, some say more years. He serves and suddenly in 2 Kings 2, after Elijah tries to cause him to stay behind, watch out for those moments when you're nearing what God has for you, the anything will come to put you off. And he suddenly says to him, what do you want? This is a huge moment. Matthew 20, I believe verse 32, what do you want? What can I do? It's a moment. We all pray, but there are some moments where what you say in that second changes everything. Or a major ministry suddenly stops and points at you. What is it you're asking for? I've heard it. And it's a moment. See, it was wonderful. I, I love to see Robert. It was, it was very powerful, actually. But it, it was crazy. It was, like, it was like feeding time at the zoo or something. It was wild. Even Christy said, I'm not going near that. And I said to myself, self, this is a moment. He's carrying something. I know what he's carrying. I'm going to demand that. You know what I want? I want that. What do you want? What has God put in your want? What has God created for you to desire so much that you'll do something about it? What do you want? Someone knows something. See, right now you should be shouting, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. I want, I want, I want, I want. I the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's a moment. 
there are moments. You know, I'm just going to finish him because I want to move on to, to another one. But it, it says, well, if you see me when I go, you can have what you want, etc., etc." And he sees the, the, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen. He, saw, he sees the, the prophet go up. He sees the mantle coming down. It's a moment. He rips off his own mantle, not knowing if the thing fitted or not. Sons of the prophets, 50 of them watching. Because you don't know, nor do I, historically, what the garments were under the garment. Whatever they were, I'm sure the son... What a risk! Whether it was undergarments or nakedness, whether he was Scottish or not... Because they wear nothing under their kilts. That's why they wear sporrans so that the wind don't blow too high. <laughs> there's, a, there's an old song we used to sing or listen to. Oh, the wind blows. This is in Scottish. Oh, the wind blows high and the wind blows low. Johnny, where your roses go? <laughs> but I'm joking to make you think you don't know what he, risk he just took. Because yeah. for a second, he ripped off his old garment. He's standing whatever he's standing. He doesn't know. He's just in faith saying, I see the moment. I'm responding to the moment. I must take, I must redeem this second. Yes, yes. At this moment, some people should be saying, that, that's mine. Now watch this really quickly. The Lord says to Abraham in Genesis 13, 14, you've heard this before, but the Lord says to him, lift up your eyes from where you are. Look north, look south, look east, look west. And everything you see is yours and your children's and your children's children. In other words, what you do right now will affect generations. I'm speaking to you. It's now the word of the Lord. It's not a moment of touch. It's the word of the Lord. God is speaking the word of the Lord to you. What Abraham does in this moment will make a difference to everything in his life. Will you lift up your eyes from where you are or will you let where you are dictate what you see? I want to say this to you prophetically. You haven't even seen anything yet. Who was that? The man with the biggest beard who catches the most anointing. You haven't seen anything yet. But because we don't know how to redeem the time, we're not looking. We're judging by where we are. We're judging what what God will do because where we have arrived from. We're judged from what side of the tracks we think we came from. We're judged by ever. But now the Lord is saying to you, I can make a lot more out of you. I want to say this to you. I can make a lot more out of you. But i got to get you to respond, and here's your moment. Will you lift up your eyes? Will you look? Will you let me show you something? Catch it. I I watched the documentary. We're nearly at the end, but how many of you know some of you are now responding? I watched a documentary on the giraffe women. Giraffe women put rings around their neck and stretch their necks. What are they doing? Their necks are coming longer and longer. And I want to be a spiritual giraffe woman. What are you looking for? Anything God wants to show me. Anything the Lord wants to let me see. I don't want to live back where I was. I want to live in where I'm going. But I want to see where I'm going. I'm telling you, by the Spirit, I'm not joking, by the Spirit, something has just dropped into the auditorium. A spiritual anticipation. I'm telling you something, a spiritual anticipation has dropped into the auditorium. I've got other points, but I can't get there because you you crowded me. Now, in this second, what you do in this second is everything. Because Abraham lifted up his eyes. 
And he began to say, I don't know what you want to show me, but I sure want to see it. I don't know what revelations are coming, but all I know is I'm looking for them. I don't know what it looks like, smells like yet, but I'm on the mission. I'm going to not miss the moment. Oh, let this sit on you. I think before we pray, we should do this. We say, we say to the Lord, Lord, if there's anything in my lifestyle that hinders you giving me a moment, I'm asking, number one, you'd forgive me. But I'm asking you that you would show me. I believe most of us know. Lord, if I'm not living worshipful, would you put a spirit of worship in me? If I'm not submissive, would you put a submissive spirit in I want to train myself unto the things of God. Sash, if you're here, come play for me, would you? I believe that the Spirit of God wants to drop a strange penitence on us. He wants to soften our hearts. He wants to make us ready. Don't let familiarity rob you, my friends. Don't let the fact you will, I know that preacher, but you don't know all about that preacher. You don't know the sacrifice of that preacher. You don't know the anointing of that preacher because you, you let something get in the way, but not from now on. I won't miss any moment from anyone at any time. I do this on behalf of the church. Elders agree with me. Lord, we don't want to miss a moment. The Lord says to me to make this declaration, and I want you to join me. I will not let my past dictate my future, but I will let the purposes of God invade me. Listen to this scripture. Listen to what this scripture says. Consecrate yourselves today, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders. Prepare yourself for your divine moments. Yes, I can minister to people and I will, but I want you to get this. I must prepare me for what God wants to do in me. I'm going to take all limits off my God. And Lord, I'm asking as we dedicate ourselves that not only a prophetic spirit, but the weight of the Spirit of God will drop into our sanctuary, will drop through online to the people that are sick at home. you got to hear this. Somebody testified at the conference about something I didn't even know that happened. I had asked people to come forward and I ministered to them to be prepared, to be prepared for what God wanted to drop on them. And a person came to testify and said, a healing came through my vertebrae when God touched me. We weren't praying for healing, but the Holy Spirit touched them. And I believe if the Holy Spirit touches you, something's about to break in you. I actually believe to prophesy over you that the Lord's about to make some of you visionaries. He's going to cause some of you to see. He's going to cause some of you to hear.
But I, I, won't, I won't go too quick. I just want you to, to do business with the Lord. Come on, friends, what do you want? What do you want? say to you, I want them to keep playing this, I want to say to you, if you want me to minister to you, I will. Or if it's good between you and God, it doesn't matter. But I know that I was supposed to minister to those two. And it's funny that they're the two on their knees. When I saw you sitting back there this morning, I knew that the Lord wanted to touch you for your next season. And I knew that the Lord wanted to touch you in such a weight of glory that you were going to carry something into your next season. I want to prophesy these words to you. Where you came from is not the limitation to where you're going. What you have walked in is not the limitation to what I have for you. But the Lord says this is a moment of divine revelation and this is a moment of divine equipping and a far greater weight of glory will fall upon you so that you will be able to administer what I have called you to do. I break the power, this is me now, I break the power of the words of the gainsayers. I break their words off you. I say what they say you can do is the limit of man. But what the Lord says you can do is what you gain in me. So Lord, let me touch with your glory. Yes. If I was Robert, I'd get you back up again, but I won't. <laughs> Let them know the weight of your glory. I release to you the visionary gift of God. I release to you the prophetic mantle that sits in this church. I release to you that you now start to gain visions and, and see the things that God wants you to see. I release an anointing upon you. Sasha, come down here, please. This girl, this girl here is a fantastic worship leader. But she doesn't have the full release of that gift that you have to release the song. And I believe you're supposed to impart it to her. Thank you, Sash. Now give me your hands. This is very important what the Lord's doing. Paul, would you join me wherever you are? We must, we must not miss moments. You are in a moment. I watched it. Now I'm touching your hands, which means I'm imparting your hands, and, and Paul's going to touch you in the shoulders. There's a mantle that he carries. Touch them, Lord. I'm 
not, to, I'm not rushing because this is important, okay? And I can feel it in my feet, which means if I feel it in my feet, you're going to carry the word of the Lord. It's a rebound anointing, isn't it? Are you reaching into God? But then again, I was sitting in front of you and I felt it in my feet. And I just heard the Lord start to speak into my spirit. And he says, not only are you mantled with the ability to, to, to do art and prophetic drawings, and the Lord says that's going to open a lot of doors. In fact, I see international doors opening for you. But the Lord says, I'm not setting you in one avenue. But I'm setting you in the avenues of those that walk in my prophetic word. The Lord says, you have been asking me specifically that healing virtues would be released. And I'm prophesying to you what I just saw. That you are going to start to see, even with your art and the opening of the doors, healing virtues begin to re be released. And creative prophetic words that will literally see, and not only just on a canvas, but you would see it in your spirit and speak it as well as paint it. And, and creative things are going to start to happen. Mantle a Lord. Mantle a Mantle a Lord. Now tell the Lord what you want. Tell the Lord what you want. Tell Him. Because you'll, you'll never go beyond your want. Now stand behind her. I'm not trying to put on a show. I'm trying to release the Spirit. That's all I'm trying to do. The Lord just told me to blow on you from a distance, okay? Now, you must understand, blowing, Jesus breathed on them. It's ruah. It means it's the breath of God. So when you carry the Spirit, you can breathe upon people, all right? He told me to blow upon you because there's another season yet. Now, why am I breathing? Because life comes through breath. Well, I'm passing on. Okay, so I'm ministering to specific people, but now as our hands are up, we, 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 we're trying to grab our moment. There's a moment in this place, isn't there? There's a moment, 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 there's a moment of redemption. There's a moment of redemption. There's a moment, there's a moment, there's a moment of redemption. I touched you and the Lord says this redemption is not just about a moment now, but it's about that which has been lost. And I I want to prophesy to you a spirit of restoration hit you right now, and that which you have lost, come back. It will come back into your hands and the moment will come to go and do it again. But the Lord says this time you will be like Job for Job lost so much. But when it came back, it came back double. And just like Job, I don't know what this means, but just like Job, you had to pray forgiveness on those that did what they did. The Lord says you pray forgiveness, you release them because the Lord's going to redeem something. Now this, this, this lady here is crazy. <laughs> you don't know this, but this lady here has got a spirit of longevity. I'm going to shock you. Is it all right? She, <laughs> she is 85. <laughs> now, all I can tell you, she's now finished, but all I can tell you is there's a joy of the Lord that sits in her and all you need to do is get around it and it will just cut. I believe that's half her, her longevity. <laughs> so all I'm going to do is I'm going to walk around. I, I was going to ask you a question. Is that all right? Do you mind praying in public? Can you give me a microphone? I want you to pray something. Is that, is that all right? It's just a short prayer. 
It's not, it's not deep. You don't have to you know, pr- pronounce things. You just have to pray. Is this on? I walked in here this morning and I, I had a vision of you and, and the vision was that you were going to pray that God release your generation into the kingdom of God. Amen? That's not hard, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Would you pray for me? Would you put your hand on it? I believe that... Come over this way. Come over this way. I want you to listen to this. She's going to pray for her generation. You must respond to the Spirit when He tells you to do things. I know you didn't hear that, but the Lord did. She was praying prophetically and she had no idea what she was doing. And I want to tell you from the Lord that what you just did, you will be doing a lot more of. Because there's an anointing about to fall on you. There's an anointing about to fall on you. It's going to be strong. It's going to be powerful. You're going to start to see things, hear things, and say things. And you won't want all that's going to go on, but it's going to go on right now. Because your generation has been called by God to carry a torch and wear a mantle that is going to cross this earth, crisscross, crisscross, crisscross across this earth. And you start to prophesy them in. You start to prophesy them in, Summer. You start to prophesy them in. You start to count what the Lord's doing. And that which you birth will be birthed, I'm telling you, into a generation that will be carrying the purposes of the king. Yep. I'm telling you, I prophesy the purposes of the king. Listen to what it says in the word of God. That a good man will leave an inheritance to his children's children. So I say to you that there's an inheritance coming right down from both family lines. All right, quickly then, tell the Lord what you want and I'll start. But I, I need to get the microphone off. That's right. You take what you want right now in the name of Jesus. Take it. Just take it. Reach out right now and receive it. And the, and the Bible said that you just receive in the name of Jesus. God, he's given you a heart like a lion. The spirit of the warrior and the mighty man. Don't be afraid of this moment right now. You're going to remember this moment the rest of your life. God's calling you and setting you apart right now. Draw in from the Spirit of God. Take what you want, whatever you want. Take it right now. Receive it. Say, Lord, I receive and I draw in what you've given me, God. I take it now in Jesus' name. Praise God. Lord, mantle this man with a double portion. Mantle him with a double portion. Mantle him, Lord, with the end time portion. Mantle him, Lord. Woo! Power. 